I just love Inga's passion and her sincerity. I just love the way that she really wants to move physical mediumship forward. So Inga, over to you. Well, hello everyone. I uh, did an interview with Medrado in Brazil two weeks ago. Unfortunately, the translation, because we were sitting outside, the wind was carrying the voices away. So Marilia had to translate the whole interview again because we all don't speak Portuguese as much as I would love to learn, but I just must be too old. I just don't get it. I just can't do it. So we, I might bring that next time, like in two weeks, but it was more about, it wasn't necessarily about his paintings and what he's doing now. It was more about the time when he was a materialization medium. And I wanted to know how it affected him, how it affected his health, his emotions, um, <clears throat> how it all took place. Uh, I wanted to know what the researchers did with him because he had some researchers working with him and, um, you know, how he felt about the whole few years he worked as a physical medium with materialization, but he only did it for, I think, three years and then it made him very sick. Maybe I think, Scott, you might can relate to that. He had... Uh, bad headaches, he got migraines, he felt nauseous and uh, then one day after a seance where the bride had turned up, um, he just felt really exhausted so when he went home he went to bed and he sleeps in the total dark so I don't know if it had anything to do with it. He seems to believe that the energy was very active still. And so the, the sparks within his auric field caught the curtain on fire and burned his unit down. And I think that was the last thing he needed to say, I'm done. And, uh, but it's very interesting how he speaks about it and how he experienced it and how people talked about it who were his sitters. But now I just, this week, I got in contact with the lady. If you ever watched the video on YouTube about the bride materializing uh, with Medrado when he was quite young, around 20. And um, so the research is the lady who was speaking. She is still alive. And I'm writing to her at the moment to see how she felt about that, how she experienced that. It probably would have been different maybe than just the sitters were experiencing. But we have to just wait for the translation when Maria is ready and carnival is over now, so it's all back to normal. So, but what we are told recently, or yeah, maybe the last six months, is continuously saying that to change physical mediumship, that sitters are more understanding and that uh, this accusation left right and center about this medium must be fraud it was the medium you know who stepped on the toes it was this it was that um the need is for the uh, the, the sitters to be more educated and actually also become aware very strongly who is in charge of the energy at any given moment? Um, it seems to be that it is for sitters or for the medium's mind or subconscious mind, especially, um, to be able to control some of the phenomena. So in no way saying the medium decides to influence the phenomena. More saying when, maybe Scott, well Scott is here, he can help with that, that when something very strongly is in the medium's mind while they go into trance or before they do a sitting, that it can influence what is happening within the seance room. 
Say, for instance, um, people have said to me, if I had an argument with my partner, it would take me so much longer to settle my mind. And then at times something would be said just in regards to that, which spirit probably would not have said, but working through the mind, they had to work with what was in the mind first. And I think, Scott, I heard a story from someone, I don't know, someone when you were the circle leader in a seance with a medium and you were stopping the communicator speaking and saying, stop, stop, give spirit back the control. Do you remember that? No, I don't. Um, the only times that I've actually had to intervene in during the sit-in was when the spirit communicator was talking to their mother and the mother became hysterical. And obviously our, our prime objective is to keep the medium safe in that vulnerable position because the medium will be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And if a mother is shouting and going, oh my God, oh my God, and they're not remaining still, I'm going to stand up and grab the form. Mm -hmm. That's going to harm our medium. And that's when Dolly materialized from the cabinet. So we had two materializations. And then she sat on my lap, Dolly, the drag queen who worked with Colin, mm -hmm. while the son carried on going to speak to his mum and dad for a good 15 minutes. Yeah. I, what was, how did the story go? I think the story went that, um, the communicator was talking not so nicely about a partner or an ex-partner or something. Oh, I thought it was you who then said, okay, let spirit have control again. This is the medium's mind. Do I no. get There must have been someone else. Said. But I just find it really, really interesting that... Uh, and I had, some, I had written down some examples when I was in a seance and the trumpet was just really hitting the sitters really hard. And some were saying, oh, more, 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 you know, and some were going, ouch, ouch, you know, like the trumpet is really hard. And then I was wondering, was it the sitters taking the energy and taking the control of the energy by getting carried away with the energy and encouraging the trumpet. Could that be? Have you heard about that? Well, of course, yeah, the, the sitters can in, interfere with the phenomena by their wants. And that's why when you enter the seance room, we always say, he who enters expecting nothing shall not leave disappointed. Mm -hmm. It's like the, the sitting we did in, in uh, America just recently when a lady said I had over 70 people there, which was an absolute wrong and misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. We didn't have 70 people there. And the sitter was more interested in phenomena than the communicators which were coming through to speak to their loved ones. So luckily she didn't actually affect the seance she just affected the sanctity after the seance. Ah, okay, yes. So uh, then, yes, so another one was, for instance, I wonder in regards to, you know, when mediums seem to have the same phenomena, you see, like at one stage, a medium told me, oh, I had, 40 or whatever, 40 reports at my last seance. And then the next day, another medium writes, well, I had 52 reports. Or, you know, somebody created water to wine or wine to water, one or the other. And then later on, another medium took that on. I asked the spirit communicators about that. I said, why would that be? Is it the same team practicing the same skill with a different medium? Or is it the medium's want to experience this that could create that? So um, another example I personally experienced then was when... Um, Kai was here, Hans will be speaking and the trumpet will, you know, just silently fly around the room. 
and Gary was in that seance and he was saying, I really think that such evidential mediumship to be able to hear the communicator, you know where the medium is that are, and then the trumpet being on the other side of the room continuously uh, moving about. So then like two seances later, uh, we were asked for the trumpet and the same phenomena happened, like Jimmy is speaking and the trumpet is on the other side of the room. Now, I wondered, was that because Gary really thought it was very evidential or would it be that the same team came and worked with him then? I just find it interesting that there is so many things are similar between mediums, some mediums, either the phenomena or... Um, uh, the stages they're going through in regards to going towards materialization. Um, is there a certain followed a protocol that the spirit people followed or because when all the mediums are really have a different makeup, would it not be very different for each medium? So I just, it's all questions. If somebody has an answer for it or somebody has thought about it or experienced something which makes sense. No? Eduardo is uh, a trans painter. He is also a physical medium. Um, how it works with his uh, trans painting. For years and years, you used oil painting, oil paints. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, he was tested by some universities in America years ago because they couldn't understand why the paint was not mixing. So normally, you know, black on white, you have a big mess. And uh, the spirit people explained that they sort of put a layer of ectoplasm between the paint layers so that they are then not in mix. Today he does with acrylic paint and that is, um, it's the same. So the paint doesn't, doesn't mix. So then somebody was saying to me, oh, you know, uh, really ectoplasm, I don't think they would use ectoplasm. So in the last visit to Australia, uh, we were somewhere and as the people are told not to use the camera, uh, definitely don't use flash. Uh, one lady, I don't know, didn't listen, I would say. Uh, and she used the flash and it actually swim it rather about a meter and a half back, like he stepped back like really fast and just stayed like in shock, stayed there for maybe 10 seconds, 15 seconds. And then it was just like shaking and he stepped forward and kept painting. He was aware of it, but he said it wasn't that it was painful or, you know, that, that he really thought something was wrong, but he was aware of being moved back really quickly and then moving back forward. So, you know, it just, just because we can't see it, we still need to listen. That mm -hmm. was the lesson for most of them then. And uh, so now the, the rule has to be when I'm there, the rule has to be there can't be any photos taken and uh, the phones need to stay out, you know, because if we can't trust them and they can't listen, there's nothing we can do. Yeah. Um, so the same is when he was in Australia at my place, um, he did a demonstration and he was saying in the interview, that's the, that's the first time he experienced, uh, phenomena around him since his younger days with the bride. But he was in my seance room, demonstrating in my seance room. And when he was painting, he was standing in front of the curtain. There was um, the curtain what had the cabinets behind him. And we could hear people marching up and down, like really loud. 
all the people watching the demonstration, they all could hear it, marching behind the curtains, like there were heaps of soldiers marking behind the curtain. And then he said, in a way, he was aware of that sound. And he was wondering what it was. And in the same sitting, um, he did 12 canvases. And then there was, um, normally he would only do 12. And so then the painters asked for another canvas. And he was um, painting a portrait of a lady. And when, when it came to painting her face, there were two big purple orbs came out of his chest onto the painting. That was amazing. And everyone could see it. And, you know, it's on YouTube somewhere, so you can see it. But it's just amazing. It's amazing. And um, it was for a friend of mine. His wife passed. And so Medvado was saying to my friend, you know, um, she knows that there is a party on for her and wherever this painting will hang that's where she will be so that was really really nice hmm. that beautiful very interesting and how then, long has he been doing it uh 25 26 years now mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um yeah so when we were talking in the in the questioning uh i was talking about the health effects he had and he said um, he has a high blood pressure and he had um, um, a lot of niggling health problems ever since and they're putting it back to being a physical medium. Then he was talking about the bride uh, they called her the bride, the lady who materialized. And some, the, one of the researchers, so I have to ask her about that. One of the researchers said that she believed it was Katie King. And so he uh, and his friend, Medrado's friend said, now it's probably a girl you left one day and now she's haunting you to get her ring. So he liked that story better than Katie King. So <laughs> it's just... <laughs> That's the way he is. <laughs> Man and ego. <laughs> he hasn't really. Yeah, no, he doesn't really. He's just so sweet. <laughs> but um, also he was talking about, um, yeah, he was talking about the side effects. He was talking about his health. He was talking about Katie King. Um I don't even know. I really can't remember. I have to listen to it again. Mm. So, yeah, I have to wait until the translations come. So, also, uh, it's interesting, I find, that that came up with him uh, thinking, you know, that it is Katie King. And then the first materialization Kai had was John King, which is supposed to be Katie King's father. Mm -hmm. And um, I found that very interesting too. It's a bit like it's a family trait to visit as materializations <laughs> within a seance room. So, uh, Scott, would you know, or maybe someone else here who reads a lot of the history, are there certain traits of materializations when it's not loved ones, when it is spirit team members? Is it sort of often the same? If you look back in history, it will also you will see trends where if you go back in the 1940s, 1950s, we had a lot of Native Americans uh, materializing. If you looked at um, Estelle Roberts with Red Cloud uh, or White Eagle, and then it moved on to Chan, which was obviously the Chinese guides and um, the silver tip. And if you looked at Alec Harris's and you had Rowan, who was the Arab man, you had, uh, you know, White Wing, you had uh, Topsy. So there's always seemed to be some kind of thread or trend with the spirit communicators. And I believe that the spirit team kind of talked to each other in the spirit world to see what will be best to drive the mediumship forward in communication 
We do also have a, a, sometimes a trend within seances where if loved ones come, and if it is a, a medium who's solely looking at the old ways, which are to get a mum and dad up in the morning instead of some kind of phenomena, which can mean nothing, um, they will bring someone who is known for everyone. So for instance, with Carlin, we would have six loved ones come out, and then we may have Peter Cook, Dudley Moore, or you have uh, Francis Gump, who will then come so everyone can take something away from that seance. Or oh, Quentin Crisp. He was very entertaining in David's seances. <laughs> so, yes, that's um, all I wanted to talk to about today. Oh, yeah, then, you know, uh, with the mind influencing or the mind controlling or the mind being so powerful, um, I was uh, looking at, um, in the past, you know, the priests, who would levitate, or in Africa, the shamans who levitate in ceremonies. I have asked about, is it spirit influence, or is it uh, mind control? Is it possible that these people have the ability to levitate just by will? And so the answer I got was, yes, it is possible both ways is possible. We can, as spirit, can levitate them, but also they can levitate themselves. So I find that really interesting in how strong the mind is. And when you think in physical mediumship, they have to work through the mind, that it could be quite difficult to keep that control of the energy at all times. Mm. Angelique has a question. Angelique, you know how to unmute yourself. Please go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Yes. Thank you, Inge, for telling us about Medrado. Um, I met Scott last week and uh, I'm quite new to the physical mediumship and trance. But as I learned, uh, and I don't know if I learned it properly because, um, you know, it's, it's also new. But the ectoplasm is part of the medium. And how will it affect the medium if uh, the paint is being layered with ectoplasm? Because it then will be sort of uh, kept away from the medium. It will not return, right? Or uh, it will be kept in the painting. So I wonder if how it works. I would, I would believe that it is a very, very, very fine layer of ectoplasm, but I have never asked about how that is possible. But I know that mediums have given samples. Medrado has a few times given samples of ectoplasm, which were taken away and were tested, and they weren't returned. Scott, how would you say that? Have you given a, a sample? Or no, because no, I haven't given a sample of ectoplasm because it actually cuts the medium. Again, if you looked at Estelle Roberts, mm. when they took the uh, sample of ectoplasm from her, which they tried to find the uh, genetic makeup of the ectoplasm, mm. when they found everything besides one chemical, which was not on the pH scale, which was something from the spirit world, when they took a lock of uh, Red Cow's hair, you heard Estelle whimper, especially when they took the sample. And when she came out of the trance states, you saw bleeding on her solar plexus, which showed whatever was taken away was connected. When we speak to Madrado about the, the layer of ectoplasm that goes across the canvas to stop the colors bleeding into each other, they said that energy goes into the canvas. And as people are aware that ectoplasm is an energy-based substance. Mm. So it can be invisible as well as visible, depending upon the genetic makeup of the medium at that moment. Mine was more about the um, who's in control. I find that very interesting. And I read your article on uh, the Facebook about the, the, the boards and the tables and what have you with the experience that you had when you were over in Somerset. Can you delve into that a little bit more about what was said there? Inga? Well, uh, while we were in Somerset for a week, there was a lot of time. So we did some table tipping. Uh, we, and 
the groups did a lot of board work, working with the Ouija board. Um, my, it's, it's definitely not something I like to do too much. Ouija board or table is not really so my thing. But um, when I was at a table, uh, when I was on the Ouija board twice, um, I had very often the feeling that um, it maybe was very influenced by the sitter's mind or by what I really wanted from that board. Uh, and it seemed to be, in general, there was one person always, um, well, the main sitter on the board. So it seemed that every communicator who was coming onto the board was for the same person. But often they would say, they spell their first, the first letter, and then the person would say, oh yeah, I know who that is, that is so-and-so. And the energy changes was on the board, it was quite significant that the energy was dropping, picking back up, dropping, picking back up. And uh, when we talked about it later, because most of the people had a great interest on working on the board, um, the communicators were talking about that it is so very easy to uh, be the board be influenced by the mind of the sitters and losing control, the spirit uh, communicators losing control. And so that maybe the spirit wants to write a sentence or a, yeah, a sentence even, and there's one word and then the sitters seem to know what the sentence is going to be and it gets spelled out, but it's actually not what the spirit people wanted to say. But the, uh, the sitters get carried away on the board with um, the energy and thinking, well, I know already, you know, that's my mom, this is what she's going to say, um, that it is quite difficult for spirit to keep the control on the board when the sitters are super excited about it. So they were saying it would be beneficial to have on the board also a medium where they focus the energy and then have actually a circle leader on the board. So whenever the energy drops to say, stop for a minute, let's give spirit control back and then continue with the board. So um, like, especially like sometimes the planchette was going so, so, so fast. And then I said, well, why didn't you stop the planchet then? And they, you know, they were saying, well, it really, the problem is that even if we say, well, let's stop it, but then the energy, sitters get carried away with the energy so, and there's no control for us anymore. So to take the control of the energy is quite easy to take it away from spirit, especially when people get carried away. That was what we were talking about in regards to table. And then obviously the muscle movement, the uh, uh, micro muscle movement with the sitters moving the planchette or, yeah. So it was interesting. So now I know why I don't like it. <laughs> so can you still hear me? Yes. Does that does that fall in the category of um, uh, thought forms when it comes to mediumship? I would not know. Mm -hmm. I really can't say. Someone else know anything, any information on thought forms? I don't really understand. It could come from the psyche. So you have psychic phenomena and you have the spirit phenomena. Psyche is from the soul. So if you were looking at... Um, poltergeist activity or anything or spontaneous phenomena without intelligence behind it, it can be from the psyche, which is the soul. Uh, for the phenomena from the spirit world, it must always be uh, done with the intelligence of a discarnate mind. So any form of phenomena must be intelligent, which is, means it's constructive, not destructive. Mm -hmm. So the psyche or is it the subconscious of the sitters who are not necessarily aware of it 
if you if you remove that to one side it's the psyche it's a it's a, it's a psych, a psychic power so the emanation of the soul within the auric field can actually create the phenomena so if the sitters are getting excited 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 that means the auric field will then react which then can cause the phenomena as well and that's why again if you looked at the psychic phenomena there's no intelligence behind it there's it will be not constructive at all it will not be uh, moving in in the manner that will be pleasing to people if it's spirit it's always done in the gentle and with the utmost respect with the educational side behind it in my case uh, out of body experiences um, you know being in two places at the same time but then that's my consciousness being in a different place not necessarily being in a different place mm. this is actually being physically uh, observed and, and uh, acting um, i mean i mean you, you sometimes hear, hear about people ha having an out-of-body experience and like i can remember reading about a, a guy that was riding a bike and he was continuing to ride the bike but he was also in the observer position but this is a little yeah. bit different yeah. because he was not observed in the observer position if you know what i mean mm -hmm. But there are, okay, and read Nicole's post. She, she, she's questioning it and wanting to know a little bit more about it. Scott? There, there were two cases, one being the Francis of Assisi, who was obviously one of our greatest healers at the time. Sorry, you've got a cat coming in here. Um, who, it was marked on many occasions that when people were ill, they would see an apparition standing at the end of the bed, and it was the Francis of Assisi. And it was a well-known case where uh, one of the um, brother monks from another monastery was falling ill, was coming close to dying. A Francis of Assisi appeared in the room and gave the person healing. But as he, he left, he touched the window. And then the next morning, a handprint was left on the window, which they couldn't wash off, they couldn't wipe off. Now, if you then looked at Brother Lawrence, who, when the, uh, Inga was speaking about the levitation, they always said that Brother Lawrence spent more time in the air than on the ground to complete his duties. Because when he looked at Jesus, or the uh, image of Jesus, he was so moved by the Spirit, they would levitate and then move over. Now, I know that it's not quite your answer, but I've had an experience where I've been sitting myself and I've closed my eyes and I felt it's not working. I've opened my eyes, the lights are on in the room, and I'm standing there and I'm looking at my sitters and my sitters aren't looking back at me. And it just so happened that I looked to the left and I saw myself sitting there. And I was so shocked at that moment because I was thinking, hang on, you know, what's going on? I, I kind of flashed and I was on the other side of the room looking at me standing up, looking at me in the chair and then moved again. And it, I was seeing about four of me at the time and I was able to move away towards the door and someone commented in our circle that someone's just walked past me. And I remember that so, so clear. And then obviously something happened. Uh, I came back into the, you know, into the conscious state. And I said to my circle, oh my God, you know, I've just had this experience, but I'm sorry I couldn't hold it for long. And they said, you've been out for over an hour. So it showed that time isn't relevant within the spiritual realm or within that state of being. But if you, if you are looking at bilocation, these, these were two prime examples. Uh, Francis of Assisi and Brother Lawrence. Bill McMonagall is the American psychic spy and uh, he's written several books and that commentary is located in one of the books, I'm not sure which one, might be the Stargate Chronicles. But basically he got um, really upset about this one particular fella and the fella was found uh, in a locked room beaten up and he believed he'd done it and yet his physical body was located 300 miles away. But he had, uh, as Scott just described, Joe McMonagall also describes problems, seeing which is a reality. Because what they would do to, to get him to do remote viewing was to put him in a chat room, the sensory deprivation room, and uh, they'd let him dream. And at the time that he was dreaming, they would randomly pick out of 5,000 images, a photograph, somebody would wake him up and they would ask him to draw the photograph of what he would draw and then he'd go back to sleep. 
and he, he would describe that sometimes he'd be waken up or he would wake up, he would talk to the person who may or may not have woken him up and he would have a discussion, philosophical debate. He, he might then leave the room to go to the toilet. So he'd walk down the corridor and he tried to put the light on then in the toilet and he wouldn't be able to put the light on. He couldn't physically touch the light. It would, his hand would go through the wall. And somebody would come along and he asked them to put the light on. They would put the light on. And he, he got to the point where he couldn't decide which reality he was in, which, which was the real reality. And then he decided the only way to measure it was the one that stayed the longest. <laughs> yeah, so he was quite impressive. I mean, it's, with him, uh, there's a lot of stuff on YouTube, no doubt. But uh, most of everything I've gleaned about him is from books or magazine articles. But yes. we were talking earlier about levitation, and we were sitting in our local pub about oh, 15 years ago, maybe. And we were sitting by a window. And the pub had bouncers. Now, why that pub ever needed bouncers, nobody knows. There's never trouble in there, only what they caused. But all the bouncers, the two bouncers and a whole bunch of people rushed out of the, um, the, the room and they were standing outside. And through the room, we could see the bouncers and the people and they all went, ooh. Uh, and then when they came back in, we said to them, well, what, what was all that about? And they said, it's that boy there. He's about 18. He just levitated up off the floor. So we, being interested parties, quizzed the young fella. And he said, yeah, I just developed it when I was about 14, something that I could spontaneously do, just rise up off the floor. And he could see that we were serious. So he said, yeah, feel my pulse. And he felt his pulse and his heart was doing 100 to the dozen. So he said, being you're interested, I'll show you it in, at exactly 10.30 p.m. because he needed time uh, to be able to do it again. So uh, true to his word, 10.30 p.m., he came up to us and said, do you want to see it? So he said, yes. <coughs> Unfortunately, we didn't go outside, which was a big mistake because he did it in a passageway which was slightly wider than your outstretched arms. But knowing what I know about the martial arts, I had to keep my eyes on his arms uh, because he could have finger gripped up the wall maybe. Uh, Margaret looked at his feet and she saw him levitate up off the ground. I quickly checked his arms and went to his feet and I saw him as if stepped down off a platform that wasn't there. But it all happened in a matter of seconds, but much longer than you could jump and, and he didn't jump anyways, his upper body stayed almost, um, you know, even, it, it wasn't a jump. Because if the medium is, is it confined to the cabinet at all times, and so the power is being contained around the medium, coming to the end of the seance, obviously you get told you're not allowed to move uh, because it, it can break the power because as you sit there, the energy is like a spider's web. It connects to everyone and at the heart of the spider web is the medium. So if someone moves, it will send a ripple back to the medium, which can cause harm and break the power. So what they do is they, at the end, they lift the medium out and then they drop it. And when they drop it, it makes people jump, doesn't it? It, it, it goes through you. And as it makes you jump, it's caused a, a break in the power, which is in a controlled environment. And then that allows the medium to return. I know when they drop me, I feel a shadow go through my body. And then I know that I'm starting to return and starting to go through the layers of consciousness. And it's just important at that moment to, to keep your mind coming back instead of actually going back to the trance states. They do it in the way that if the seance is very, very uh, hyped up, and um, there's a good power there, they'll do it. And if the, if the power's weaker or if they just find it more pleasing, maybe the medium's back is hurting or anything like that, they won't drop them, um, which is very normal with myself. They'll lift me, they'll turn me and then drop me. Um, and so that I then face into the cabinet or they'll move me to another point. So when they turn on the light, the light's not gonna be directly into my eyes. 
Radon was never sitting in a cabinet. He like a little library room, yeah, on both sides, full of books, a door in the back. So he put, they would put a black curtain all around and then a door in the front. So <clears throat> where the bride would come out with, into the room where the sitters were. So there was no chair, no. What Scott was explaining, seeing himself within the room and in the cabinet. I remember Kai, Kai was always going, you know, they say I'm talking and I can't hear anything and I don't know, believe it, maybe it's just my mind. And he would say the first time he believed that everything was real was when he found himself sitting in the seance room between the sitters in the corner and he was looking down at him and yeah, everything is there. And then he saw himself on the chair in front of the cabinet talking, when Hans was talking. He said, for me, that was the best. All my doubt was gone. Yeah. I've just got a quick question. Um, getting back to what Inga was uh, saying in the beginning about the spirit teams and uh, spirit beings, being found in all different mediums kind of seances coming through. Um, I'm fascinated by this because we are getting similar characters coming through in seances uh, in the European tradition. And it's almost a sense that spirit people up there have a little friend group and they say, oh, so, you know, there's a light coming down there, so we'll go visit. Um, because a lot of these people knew each other too back in the day. So the you know, if they were from the 1920s or the 30s, there's little groups of people. Do you find that that is so across the, the spectrum? Yeah, I, I believe that maybe even though we think that there's each medium has their own, um, their own spirit team and, you know, like, I don't know how many in a spirit team, but um, I, I personally from sometimes things I hear and I think I heard them there and I heard them there and I heard them there. It's for me, it's like maybe there is a big group in the spirit world working with physical mediums, but I think they're very much intermixed. Maybe they have a different name, but sometimes it feels the same energy coming across. So I don't know. I believe there are not as many different people working with all the physical mediums than it seems. But yes, Scott might can say something to that. Sorry, I didn't mean to, to lead you away from that. But when we've had communication from Leslie Flint and other mediums of the past from the spirit team, they said there's a, there's a collective consciousness of about 40 of the, the influential mediums who continue to do seances in the spirit world to get high knowledge, but then cascade it through us mm -hmm. as well. So we, we keep in the door open. But they also said that they are also assisting in the development because as a medium, they know the peculiarities which have happened within development. So they're trying to help as many of people who are working, as a, as, especially as an evidential medium, to try and give the continuity of life after life. Jack Webber is very influential because he passed when he was 33 years old, um, over doing seances, doing three seances a day. So he's trying to make sure that no one goes down the same route as what he did. That's crazy. Mm. Mm. My God, your poor okay. body. Thank you both. Obviously, it's been a fantastic discussion and it's great that we can have people to just toss around these ideas and these questions. Uh, thank you very much for bringing in the, influence, the knowledge of what you've experienced with Madrado. And uh, we look forward to seeing his interview when, when we get the translation happening. And uh, thanks, Scott, for coming. And I know you're very busy and really, we really appreciate you mm -hmm. being here.